Hello and welcome to Houlihan Loki 101. I'm Mark Barton and today I'm joined by Andy Lund. Now after an 11-year career as a pilot in the Royal Air Force, Andy moved into the equally fast-moving world of private equity, firstly on the sell side before moving in-house on the buy side. Now he's global co-head of Houlihan Loki's private funds group. He and his team provide strategic advisory and placement agency services to alternative investment managers globally. He's here today to talk us through the Houlihan Loki approach to raising funds and to provide some words of wisdom to those embarking on fundraising during these challenging and difficult times. Andy, great to have you on today. Great to be here, Mark. Andy, you want to start with the RAF. How does an RAF pilot become an investment banker? Look, flying aeroplanes for the queen and country uh, was a boyhood dream. Uh, so when everybody started having more sensible aspirations, age 12, 13, 14, I still was banging on about being an RAF pilot and um, you know, ultimately fulfilled that ambition. And so joined the Air Force, in fact, was sponsored, in the, sponsored through university by the Air Force. So really it was one of those things where I couldn't believe you were paid to do it. And then ultimately, uh, you know, went through the various training cycles, both actually on helicopters and also on fast jets, which was unusual. Uh, got everything out of my system um, and then decided, you know, when you get to a certain point in life, maybe there's a proper job out there um, or a different job. And via business school, um, ended up uh, joining forces with UBS and from day one was in their private funds uh, placement agent business and so I've done that ever since and so that was your, the transition. Your former colleagues in the RF will say a proper job are you, are you saying this isn't a proper job you're, you're already going to be you're that already going to be told off for that. Let's talk about the private funds group Andy how does it differ from other placement agents? You know, I'll tell you a little bit more about my trajectory so having spent some time at UBS which was a classic you know blue chip uh, placement agent business. Um, I actually went in-house, as you referred to uh, during your introduction, uh, with Advent, which is, you know, absolute top class firm. Um, never used a placement agent, so didn't know much about it other than it had tremendous success and, and, and formidable returns. But actually being in-house allowed me to see a different side of the business. So I was still working with investors, still helping Advent raise capital, but I was also involved in many other initiatives that were relevant to the investors, reporting, AGM planning, you know, the advisory committee uh, meetings, all these other things that are really important in, in a sort of uh, private equity context versus just a fundraising context. And so ultimately left that role, uh, got an entrepreneurial itch to go and set up a business in partnership actually with another private equity firm uh, called Riverstone, um, who helped get us into business. And what we were trying to create was almost a placement agent 2.0. We wanted to bring some of those in-house perspectives, some of that strategic advisory, um, you know, some of those strategic advisory components, in addition, of course, to capital raising into a new firm. Um, and so that's what we did in, in 2014. We repurposed it. And I would say, how do we differentiate ourselves? Um, firstly, we have to have the experience. So we have about 30 people. That team's done about 250 fundraisings. It's raised somewhere in the region of $280 billion of capital. Um, so there's a lot of experience there. There's also a lot of shared tenure. So three of the four managing directors have all worked together at multiple places, but we all go back to the UBS days. So again, we can answer each other's sentences. We, we, we've you know, got that longstanding sort of working relationship, which is important. Um, so, so we have experience um, and we have that shared tenure, but everybody says that. So that's a sort of entry ticket into a, into a meeting with a potential client. Where I do think we differentiate is how we use that experience. So we are super focused. Uh, and again, uh, all other placement agents will say they're focused, but we really are. We're resolutely focused on doing eight to 10 mandates at any one time. Because that means we can give our clients the entire team, all of that senior attention, all of that expertise, uh, and, and really impact uh, one of the processes that we're involved with. Because some of them require, you know, a lot of a lot of work. 
um, again, many people say that. So how do we how do we sort of guarantee to our clients that we are providing that focus? I think it comes back to um, ultimately alignment of interests. And since we set the business up, we and, and since we've subsequently become part of Houlihan Loki, um, the senior members of our team invest alongside our clients in the funds that we raise which we think is the best possible way of demonstrating conviction about one of these fundraising processes. Um, you know, it's almost a buy side decision, if you will. And, and many other agents won't do that. So we think that is really the sort of key differentiator that sort of, you know, allows us to give that focus and that attention to the process. We're which brings me on to the raising funds part, the Houlihan Loki approach to raising funds. I mean, you touched on that element there. How else does your approach differ when it comes to fundraising? I, I think, I mean, a capital raise is a, is a process which, um, you know, is, if they're not generic. You've got to, back to my point about having a plan A, it will change naturally as the facts change. Uh, they're more like political campaigns in some way. You're reacting almost on a daily basis to what you've learned from the investors and what happens at the, at the client level, at the, at the general partner level, if they've had a, an exit of an investment or you know some news that you want to get out, you're constantly pivoting. So the process will change. But generally speaking, um, you know there is a there is a sort of playbook as to how you how you sort of run these processes. Um, what I would say about the Houlihan approach is, firstly, when we set the business up as Beartooth. Um, we didn't have a black book of clients to sort of walk across the street. We had to go out and create that book of business. So uh, naturally, we started working with funds very early in their life. Um, so we've done lots of funds one, two, and threes, the so-called emergent managers. Uh, probably about two thirds of the of, of the business to date has been in that in that sort of uh, sphere. And, and you know, many would agree that that's probably the most challenging. Uh, those are the most challenging mandates. Getting the first dollars for early funds is, is difficult. So I think we've, we've, as we've grown the business, we've certainly gone through those harder yards. And I think that demonstrates, uh, you know, a capability that, that is very different to perhaps a placement agent that might focus on maybe top-up mandates for more mature managers where it's bringing in a few extra names here or a few names there. You know, we're, we've actually done a lot, spent a lot of our time actually creating new firms. And I think that that differentiates us and it, it really does underscore the approach that, that we go to market with. How has the fundraising process, Andy, been affected, if at all, by the by the coronavirus pandemic? Uh, I mean, I think like all businesses, uh, the pandemic has, has certainly had, um, you know, significant impact um, in different ways. Uh, some, some actually, some, you know, neutral to positive, uh, many ways it's negative. Uh, the, the challenge, the biggest challenge for what we do is, as it relates to COVID, it, it is the lack of, or the restrictions around travel and the lack of mm. physical meeting during lockdown periods. Um, you know, placing a fund which is often 10 to 12 years in length, it's an illiquid asset. Often these funds go for longer than that. I think the average life of a fund is maybe 15 years. Uh, you know, if you're an investor, you really want to really diligence the people who are behind the, the you know, the team that's going to be investing your capital. And so I think there's just been a reluctance to gravitate to a virtual process from day one, even though from day one, many of us were adopting Zoom as, or, or Teams or whatever as the sort of new normal, actually underscoring a commitment into a fund. I, I think LPs generally still want to have that human interaction at some point. And so when you can't meet or can't travel, that, that's the bit that I think has, 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 has been sort of put on ice as we're all watching to see what happens in the future. Um, there's definitely been a trend that L for, for LPs to move gradually towards a, a fully virtual process, but I'd say it's still, you know, the minority. Um, so, so that remains to be seen how that piece is, is solved going forward. And that's definitely hindered progress. You talked about your path from Beartooth Advisors, your prior private equity placement agent, to being, let's say, snapped up by Houlihan Loki. What attributes of 
that business have stayed the same. I'm talking about the, the flexibility, the attributes of a boutique firm, because one would imagine the boutique aspect would be very important. Uh, it's a great question, and, and for sure. And, and actually, you know, we weren't looking to, we were quite happy being entrepreneurs and growing our business, and we'd had some, uh, we were enjoying some pretty reasonable success as, as a sort of, you know, as, as, a, as a Beartooth platform. Um, so it, it was by good fortune that we got talking to Houlihan. Uh, and actually, that was one of the key things for me. You know, we, we were, when Houlihan ultimately uh, showed interest in, in acquiring Beartooth, um, first of all, it was obviously been looking for a business like ours for, for a long time. And it was the whole, you know, Goldilocks syndrome. And we were just right, if you will. Um, but also, it was an in, it's an independent boutique. So we felt that was still a continuation of the values that we set out to achieve when we first set the business up. Um, it was hugely sponsor centric. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's you know, got so many touch points with the sponsor community globally and specifically in our core markets, which is in you know, the US and Europe. That was a huge, uh, you know, huge synergy for us. Um, and it was a mid-market player. It doesn't try and do the bulge bracket mega deals it's very much the the category killer in the mid market which is where most of our clients reside and so on multiple levels it was a great fit and we come in obviously as a product team which which spans the group globally um, that also gives us additional attributes when we first set up Bertie's, as i mentioned we were trying to be a placement agent 2.0 what i meant by that is it wasn't you know the capital raising aspect is always going to be super important but we wanted to provide a service to our clients that could start, you know, in some scenarios where someone's thinking of leaving a bigger firm and starting their own and maybe helping them with that early capital, individual deals before they get to the fund. And then once they get set up, helping them develop that business, new strategies, expansion, et cetera, into secondaries, uh, single asset vehicles, uh, and ultimately uh, into, into a you know, situations where they might want to sell a piece of that business, a stake sale. And that was the, the vision to be a sort of one-stop shop to really be able to provide all of those advisory services. And of course, that was going to take some time to grow into that. Houlihan just super scales our ability. So whilst we've stayed pretty true to our knitting and quite focused on the number of mandates that we raise capital for, that sort of eight to 10, we're now involved in, you know, all sorts of other discussions with the parts of Houlihan that can help with some of those other functions. And, and, you know, we're part of the glue that holds all that together. Andy, what aspect of your job provides you with the most satisfaction? Ultimately, it's delivering on our clients' objectives. Uh, we, we don't do many mandates at any one time. They all have to work. So, you know, all are equally important. And so would, would, would be equally satisfying when they're completed. However, I would say, you know, certainly for those new managers that we, we help with uh, their first or second funds where it's more difficult, that there's probably an additional layer of satisfaction there, in, 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 given the fact we've really helped get somebody into the private equity business for the first time. That, that's, that's really rewarding. Andy, if I was looking to raise a first-time fund, what are the key things I should be focusing on? The first thought is you've got to really, you've got to really know that you want to do it. It can't be a sort of nice next step if you're sitting in a bigger private equity firm and thinking about your future. You've got to show real commitment, real ambition. Uh, it's an entrepreneurial journey. Um, so, so that commitment is really important. LPs will want to see that emotional, uh, that emotional commitment. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, you've got to go into it with an open mind. Uh, these processes will probably take longer than you'd like. Uh, they'll throw up more challenges that you that you didn't think about. Um, and you've got to sort of roll with the punches. It's as we call it with our clients, an emotional roller coaster. Um, so you've got to be prepared for that. And thirdly, you should speak to someone like us. You should get an advisor because, you know, there will be questions every single day, which you didn't even know about until you get out there on the road. And we've seen it many times where even with a great fact pattern, um, new firms have unfortunately made a footfall early in the process and you don't 
get a second chance to make a first impression. So having an advisor on side, I, I think is really important, particularly in these in these times, even without COVID, just given how, how crowded it is and, 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 and the help needed to navigate um, that marketplace. Andy, you mentioned co-investment in relationship to COVID. Is it now a prerequisite when it comes to fundraising? Uh, it, it's not a prerequisite. I mean, co-investment has been uh, gradually growing uh, almost as its own asset class uh, as private equity continues to uh, mature. Uh, so most investors can now invest in single assets, uh, which, which, in addition to the fund commitment, um, and have very active co-investment programs. The reason I mentioned it in relation to COVID is, is purely because when you're looking for additional catalysts to try and get investor attention, because co-investment is, is, is highly attractive, uh, it's just another uh, you know, tool in, in, the, in the toolbox that you can use to try and, uh, again, catalyze a, a, a fund commitment. So I, I would say in this environment, it's very important if you have the capability of giving co-investment to really go about that in the, in the most thoughtful way. Um, of course, there are other GPs that don't give off co-investment and therefore it's a, you know, less, of, less of a relevant point. But certainly for those that do, it's, 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 it's quite effective to catalyze the process. Okay, Andy, if you could give your clients one bit of advice, what would it be? Great question. Uh, look, this, this may seem quite a basic response, but I think it is all about just thinking far ahead, uh, being prepared, doing everything you can in advance, including that sort of pre-marketing activity. We like to be there as early as possible so we can help really inform the narrative and come up with the best possible plan. And that's never been more relevant you know, in this environment with, with COVID and, and, and the various issues than, than, than ever before. Andy, fantastic to talk to you today. Thanks for joining us on Hula Had Loki one-on-one. Thank you.